Hello Year 11 and welcome to a session on conquering the case study. So throughout your eight topics of the GCSE you have lots and lots of examples and then you have for each topic some case studies. Now these case studies are larger than examples and for these case studies you need very specific facts and points that you can raise in particularly your eight mark questions in your GCSE exam. So this session will be on how you conquer that case study and how you use them effectively in your exam answers. So first of all, what are case studies all about? What are they linked to? So biggest thing obviously is location. Where are they? And then we've also got the impact of them, the impact of whatever it is, whatever topic it is you are studying. And then we've got SEEP, social, economic, environmental and political categories. So what we try to do is we try to group those impacts into those four categories. And finally, they're about evaluation as well. So you will have some case studies that have responses, for example, to an earthquake. What did the government and people do as a result of the earthquake happening? And were those responses then good responses or bad responses? So it's location, impact, seep and the responses. And if you have all of those things and put them together, you have a case study. Now, to start off, what I'm going to talk through is just some general things on how you use case studies and points to remember for your exam. So the first one is read exam questions very, very carefully. OK, and the reason for that is because it may be asking you for a very specific part of a case study. And if it does that, you need to try and make sure that you don't just write a random paragraph that describes everything that happened in the case study. So try and be as specific as possible. Always use a case study for an eight mark question. Now, some of the eight mark questions will not say using a case study. But you need to know that every time you answer an eight mark question, you must use a case study. And another thing, when you get the question, bug the question. So bug the question simply means B, put a box around the command word. So that will usually be the first word and it will be explain or evaluate or assess. You underline the geography, underline what you are actually being asked to talk about. And G, glance back at that question again as you write your answer, okay? So every time you do a short paragraph, glance back up at the question and make sure you are still answering that question. For each case study, you must know at least, at a minimum, two impacts or two effects and two responses if there are responses. So you must have at least two impacts. If you have any less than that, you will not be able to reach any sort of high level out of eight marks. Also, if you are aiming for a seven to nine target grade, you will need more than two impacts. You're going to need probably four to be able to discuss them at length in detail. OK, um, try to categorize your impacts or your responses into C social, economic, environmental and political impacts. So, for example, with an earthquake, if homes were lost during that earthquake, that would be a social impact because it mainly affects people. With an earthquake, if it costs £120 million to fix the problems it created, and that's a response, that's an economic response and so on. Third, uh, fourth thing, always use peel. Always peel paragraph your answers. And what does that mean? It means make a point, explain that point really well, use evidence from the case study in question, and try to link back then to the question. That links very well with bugging the question. Glance back at the question and write a sentence that links straight back to that question. Next, where you can pick out two specific dates or bits of data from your case study you can use. So for every case study you've got, try to know 
or try to have two specific bits of data or dates that are specific to that case study. Why? Because very simply, it tells the examiner that you know the specific details of that case study and you can be as specific as possible. And finally, answer the actual question. If you're asked, do you agree with something? Make sure you say, I agree or I disagree. Pick a side of the argument. Decide which side of the argument you agree with most and argue for it. And remember that evaluating something means look at the strengths, look at the weaknesses and decide which arguments are best. So what we're going to do now is for every single topic of the eight topics, we are going to go through each of the large case studies for those topics. So we're going to start with the start of your GCSE course, which started in year nine, and that was ecosystems. Now, there are three case studies for ecosystems, and this is the first. So this is the Costa Rica case study. And the first part of it was the Samasati Nature Reserve. Now, this was a case study about eco-friendly tourism or eco-tourism. OK, so this is an eco-friendly way of using the rainforest. So the causes of deforestation very briefly, right? What actually causes deforestation? Because that is the biggest threat to ecosystems in Costa Rica and the rainforest itself. So we've got, remember that deforestation is the loss of trees, cutting them down on often a large scale. And we've got logging, mineral extraction, population pressure, commercial farming and subsistence farming. So logging is obviously cutting the trees down to use to make tables, anything with wood and then they are exported. Mineral extraction is mining. So mining in tropical rainforest areas for oil, tin and other minerals. Population pressure. So that's all about people moving into these areas um, and settling in these areas because of the pressures in urban areas outside of them. So urban areas are quite built up, already quite densely populated. So people may choose to move nearer to the rainforest where it's less densely populated. Commercial farming is all about large businesses and large areas of land being cleared to grow crops on and to raise cattle, for example, cows on for meat. And then finally, we've got subsistence farming, and that is about growing and hunting to support the community. So it's local community farming. And this has a very small impact on tropical rainforest because it is small scale. Now, specifically then, the Samasati Nature Reserve and in general deforestation, what you find is that the impact of all of this deforestation are as follows. Soil erosion. The soil is actually exposed to the air and the sun, which means it's eroded further. Loss of biodiversity. Climate change. Releasing of CO2. When you chop down trees, remember trees are a CO2 store. So when you chop them down, they, that releases that CO2. They no longer store it. So that's a loss of a carbon sink. We also get water pollution. But we do have economic gain because we cut the trees down for an economic use, such as farming. More jobs, which is a good thing, a positive thing, and increased taxes. Now, the solutions to these impacts and the solutions to these problems in general are things like selective logging. So actively selecting small areas to log, not doing it on a mass scale. Ecotourism which is the Samasati Nature Reserve is a good example. Um, national parks, education on why we should and why we should not chop down trees. International agreements and debt reduction. Now, on the right hand side here, the image is from the Samasati Nature Reserve. And around this image, there are examples of how the Samasati Nature Reserve is designed to minimize the impacts of tourism. So let's pick out some examples. No heavy machinery was used to construct it. The timber was very local. The rainwater is collected um, on the roofs and then used for toilets and showers. 
The colours of the building are natural colours. They blend in with the landscape. There is natural light used and ventilation, so that minimises energy use. And finally, the buildings are on stilts, and that reduces the humidity in the pods themselves, in the little shacks, and also it allows natural drainage. So it doesn't stop natural drainage flows taking place. So that is your example of ecotourism, the Samosati Nature Reserve, and just previously was the causes of deforestation and the impacts and solution to those problems. The next case study you had in ecosystems was about the Arctic Council. Now, the Arctic Council, we need to be very clear here, is an example of global sustainable management of an area. OK, so this is a global approach to managing an ecosystem and the ecosystem is the Arctic. OK, so the countries involved include, as you can see on the map, Canada, the United States, Alaska, um, Denmark, Svalbard, Iceland, Russia and so on. And um, it was formed in 1996. There's eight member states and it aims to protect the Arctic ecosystem through cooperation through these countries working together. So it aims to protect them. It aims to reduce emissions and pollutants. It monitors the Arctic environment and it tries to create sustainable use of the environment. Now, what's its success has been? It has helped to negotiate three legally binding contracts, so they are in law. It also has enhanced research so it has good understanding of the ecosystem itself and therefore can make informed decisions. And it has created the potential for a future Arctic Treaty. Of course, there is an Antarctic Treaty in the South Pole, but there is currently no Arctic Treaty to protect the Arctic itself. So they are the really successful things. Now, the things that have not worked so well are as follows. There is no programming budget. In other words, the Arctic Council does not actually have a set budget that it can spend on trying to develop sustainable development. Um, it's not legally binding. So the Arctic Council's rules and recommendations are not legally binding. They cannot force countries and companies who use the Arctic to follow those to the word. Pirate fishing has also increased in the Arctic and pirate fishing essentially means illegal fishing. And the council's existence is under threat. And the reason its existence is under threat is because it is not a legally binding organisation. It cannot make treaties and laws. It can only recommend how the Arctic should be used. So you would use this case study if you were asked in a question to evaluate or assess the success of a global sustainable management strategy. Now, next then, and the final case study in ecosystems is the ICE Hotel. And the ICE Hotel is an example of local or small scale sustainable management. So it's very different to the Arctic Council because this is local. It's within a country, it's a small place. Now the ICE Hotel is a hotel built out of ice. And what you would be essentially asked to do with this would be to examine or identify or assess or explain the impacts of local sustainable management or the success of a local sustainable management strategy in an ecosystem. So how has it minimised the impacts and how is it sustainable? So we've got three ticks here. The first one, the building materials are obtained from the river, including furniture and even drinking glasses after winter season when the water melts and the water returns to its source. So all the materials are very locally obtained. There is use of solar panels for energy sources. So it tries to be more sustainable and cut down its fossil fuel use. And finally, the ICE Hotel is certified as an eco, eco hotel by the Nordic Swan Eco Label, and that is Scandinavia's eco labeling program. So it has actually been certified as being very eco friendly. So there are all the positive minimizing impacts or examples of being sustainable. Now, two negative impacts for you, two things that this hotel does not do well 
is not being sustainable about. One, in winter season, the hotel needs to use unsustainable energy sources. Okay, so in winter, it does need to actually use fossil fuels. And secondly, the hotel depends on climate change effects. So shorter winter seasons, for example. Climate change is going to affect the ability of this hotel to remain as it is today. Now, to summarise that, on the bottom right of your screen where my mouse is now, there is a shorter version of everything we have just said. OK, so that is a way of you being able to think about it in a much shorter way. Some very clear, simple examples. So that is ecosystems done. Your next topic in year nine was urban futures. Now, urban futures has two major case studies and they are two contrasting case studies as well. So as you can see at the top there, we had Birmingham, which is an AC. An AC obviously means advanced country. So developed and rich versus Istanbul. And Istanbul is an EDC and that is an emerging developing country. So it's not a very poor country, but it's also not fully developed. And they are both cities in those countries. And you had to look at the challenges and the sustainable solutions. So very similar in, in a way to ecosystems. You had to look at the problems and solutions. Now, let's start with Birmingham. Where is it? It's in the West Midlands. If you think about that on a map, literally think about the middle of England. OK, the West Midlands. Uh, it's the UK's second largest city and the second largest population. It has an economy worth 120 billion US dollars. So it's a very large economy, very important to the UK. And it has seven major UK universities. So it is a very, very important city to the UK. Now, what challenges has it faced? One third of people live in 10% of the most deprived areas in the UK. In other words, this area has a very no, a high number of deprived areas. OK, and they are the 10% most deprived areas in the UK. There is some large scale unemployment due to deindustrialization. Now, deindustrialization means the falling amounts of manufacturing, making things over the years. So the steel industry, the cotton industry, etc. So there is large scale unemployment due to that falling over the years. There is quite a large amount of inequalities in certain areas and wealth differences between certain areas as well. So they are the challenges it faces, the problems. Um, one thing to mention about how the city has been regenerated and how more money has been gathered and the economy has been made more wealthy is through the Bull Ring. So the Bull Ring Shopping Centre, some of you might have been, um, was built or re regenerated in 2003. So it was extended. And now it's the third largest retail centre in the UK. And that's actually really important for the Birmingham economy because that draws in lots of people from around the UK to it. And finally, then, looking at its sustainability. So the Birmingham Library has been built. Now, this library is an example of how Birmingham has become more sustainable. 95% of the building is waste recycled. In other words, it's come from waste that's been recycled. It employs 250 local people. It uses natural daylight and it has a rooftop garden to attract wildlife. So that's obviously environmentally sustainable mostly as well. So all of those are really good examples of how Birmingham has become more environmentally sustainable and it's tried to solve or, ch or fix the challenges it faces. Now, in contrast to that, we have Istanbul and that is in Turkey. Now, location and importance again. It has a 15 million population okay so it has got a larger population than birmingham it is a large city and um, it's in between two continents so it sits right between europe and asia 
and it is Turkey's main trade and finance hub. So it's a really important city for Turkey and actually is a really good gateway city between Europe and Asia. Now, what challenges does it face? So it has one of the fastest growing populations in the world. It's suffering from what's called rapid urbanization. Okay, so lots and lots of people are moving to this city. Historic suburbs, so residential areas outside the city, such as Beoglu and Essenler, have become over the years run down. Squatter settlements or slums have grown in size and amounts. And it is one of the most traffic congested cities in the world. So car use volumes are very high here. And that creates lots of traffic in this city. Now, how has it tried to solve these problems? First of all, just to mention, Beoglu and Essenler have been regenerated over the past 20 years. OK, so they did become run down, but they have sustainably redeveloped those areas. And now they have young professionals mainly living in them. Another way it's become sustainable is through the Istanbul metro system. And that has helped to tr solve the traffic problems the city has. So that currently has eight routes and one of those has been recently added. It reduces the amount of road commuters. It has a variety of routes and it's cost effective. It's quite cheap. That continues to expand. OK, so that is examples of sustainability and challenges in Istanbul in Turkey as well. So they are two very different case studies on the, on cities, one in AC, Birmingham, and one in an EDC, Istanbul. What would you be asked to do to use this? So again, you might not be asked to specifically use the A city, but it may say in an AC you have studied, and um, discuss the challenges and sustainable solutions of that place, okay? So it will focus on challenges and sustainable solutions. OK, tectonics. So we've got plate tectonics and weather hazards. All right. Now, our tectonic activity, first of all, our tectonic hazard case study was Haiti. And that was an earthquake in 2010, one of the largest earthquakes in recent years. And for tectonics, you will look at the impact or effects and you will also look at the responses for this one. So. Some of the impacts, let's start with social, and that means effect on people. Three million people affected overall, 220,000 deaths and 300,000 injuries. OK, so they are the impact on people. The economic impacts then. So this is about effects on the government and money and jobs. OK, 30,000 business buildings collapsed. Businesses were therefore destroyed. And there was damage to the main clothing industry. OK, so Haiti is a big clothing exporter. There was damage to that clothing industry. So there are social and economic impacts. Now, responses. OK, so your primary responses. These are your immediate responses within the first few days. So your primary responses were the Dominican Republic, which is neighboring it. OK, bordering it, provided emergency water and medical supplies as well as heavy machinery to start and help with the search and rescue mission. OK, so obviously, if you look at the picture on the bottom right here, lots of rubble was created. Remember, this is a country that is an LIDC, a low income developing country. And therefore, a lot of the buildings were not as structurally sound as they would be in the UK. And when it had this big earthquake, a lot of them collapsed. OK, so. The uh, heavy machinery was used to actually move the rubble to try and find any survivors. And also another primary response was that emergency rescue teams arrived from a number of countries, for example, Iceland. So more developed countries. Now, the secondary responses, these are more long term. OK, so these are over months and years. Um, money was pledged by organizations and governments to assist in rebuilding in Haiti. But slow progress had been made only after one year. And after one year, there were still 1,300 temporary camps for people to live in set up. So after one year, there was still a very large amount of camps. And finally, cash for work programs are paying Haitians to clear the rubble. So today the rubble has been cleared, but in the years after, cash 
was actually paid to Haitian people, people from Haiti, to help clear the rubble. Okay, so they are your secondary responses. Now, on the right hand side again, I won't read through it, but there is a shorter summary of those. Okay, so remember at least two response, at least two impacts, at least two responses. Okay, so you can really explain them in your exam question. And again, an exam question on this would say about a tectonic hazard to explain the impacts and responses of a tectonic hazard. Okay. Now, weather hazards are different because they're not about plate boundaries or tectonics. They're about weather and climate. All right. And our example of this was the typh Typhoon Haiyan. And that was in 2013. This was the largest ever recorded typhoon or hurricane. All right. The reason it's called a typhoon, remember, is because this is in Asia. Now, again, we need the economic and social impacts as well as the environmental ones here and also the responses. So let's talk about the economic impact. Overall economic cost was around 5.8 billion US dollars. And that roughly equates to just under 4 billion pounds. So a lot of damage and a lot of money as a result. Six million workers lost their sources of income. So six million people lost their effectively lost their jobs, lost where they actually get their money from. Social impact, uh, 7,000 people killed, 1.9 million people homeless, 6 million people displaced, and that means that 6 million people had to move from where they currently were. And there were outbreaks of disease in the area afterwards because of lack of sanitation, lack of food, lack of water, lack of shelter, and lack of medication. And finally, then the environmental impact where that there was widespread widespread floods um, and that destroyed many homes businesses and coastal areas as well as habitats that were on those coastal areas so they're all your impacts now your responses there are two here even though loss of life was significant it could have been much worse because the efforts of the philippines meteorological agency were so good that they were able to warn lots of people in advance that this typhoon was coming. So it broadcast on TV, radio and the news evacuations and it evacuated 750,000 residents. So they did actually try to reduce the impact. They did evacuate people. There was warnings beforehand. And also another response was that the UK government helped provide food and shelter and water um, and medicine and other supplies to up to 800,000 people. OK, so the UK and international government got involved because it was such a big disaster in 2013. And on the right here, you've got a shorter summary of Typhoon Haiyan in 2013 with the impacts and responses. And you can see on the bottom right here in this image just how much devastation there was. And this, remember, was to an area in the Philippines that was not extremely well developed already. So it was already, it already had weakness in it. Okay. Now, your next topic of the GCSE was the UK in the 21st century. So this is your fourth topic. And we have two case studies for this. The first one was Cambridge in the UK. And Cambridge in the UK is an example of a business location in the UK. And your job with Cambridge is to identify the advantages of Cambridge as a business location, somewhere to set up a new business and run a business, and the disadvantages of Cambridge as somewhere to set up a new business and run that business. So some background. Cambridge, the southeast of England. Um, the science park it has is three kilometers from the city center and it has a university, obviously, and it's a science city. So you will know that the University of Cambridge is in Cambridge and that is one of the leading universities in the world and definitely in the UK. So it produces very high quality, talented, skilled people to go into business. Now, the advantages of Cambridge as a business location. One advantage is that it has a worldwide reputation in education. 
science and technology. And it also has, therefore, very highly qualified workers living within it. Um, it has an attractive landscape. So if you've ever been to Cambridge, you will notice that it's very rural before you actually get into the centre of Cambridge. It's a very nice area, it's surrounded by green belts that cannot be built on. It has great accessibility, really good link roads to the M11, the M1 and the A1M, which obviously means it's got very good links across to Milton Keynes and Birmingham and down to London and so on. And it has high quality housing as well. So they are all the advantages of Cambridge as a business location. It's an attractive area. However, it also has disadvantages. The first one is that many companies are footloose which means they are not tied down to a location. And that means that essentially they can move at any time. Um, house prices in Cambridge are very high, which might put some people off from living in Cambridge or moving to Cambridge. And obviously the highly qualified graduates might not have that much money, so they might move away from Cambridge to a cheaper area or city. And the city is quite overcrowded and congested. So lots and lots of people live in a very small space. It's very densely populated. And traffic is a major issue in Cambridge. There is lots of traffic congestion. It is a one way system, but a lot of people use it to get through to the M1 and the A1M, etc. So that is Cambridge as a business location and its advantages and disadvantages. And again, a question on this that could come up could be identify a business location or a business hub in the UK and explain its advantages or disadvantages. Now, the second case study in the UK in the 21st century was the UK's role in the Middle East. And this is quite a short case study, okay? But we need to look at what the UK has done in history and its role in the Middle East. OK, so places such as Turkey, Yemen, Pakistan, etc., Iraq, Afghanistan and so on. So the background to this, um, the UK is part of NATO, the EU and the UN. OK, now those are international organisations that promote peace. OK, they want peace in the world. They want to avoid wars reduce the problems that wars create and try to create peaceful nations. However, the Middle East, as we know, has been involved in conflicts such as the Gulf War and the Iraq War in the early 2000s. And these wars um, had the UK involved as well. So the UK did get involved in these wars as part of NATO and the EU and the UN to try and resolve the problems and to try and create peace. So what was the UK involvement? The UK basically trades oil and military goods with the Middle East. OK, so the UK gets quite a lot of its oil currently from Russia and also Saudi Arabia. OK, and many Middle Eastern companies invest in the UK. So, for example, the Shard in London is actually very heavily um, invested in by the United Arab Emirates in the Middle East. Um, Islamic terrorism threatens UK security. So because Islamic terrorism has threatened UK security over the past 15 to 20 years, the UK has got involved to protect itself. But remember, it's got involved with NATO, the EU and the UN as well. Now, one of the biggest involvements we've had in recent years with the Middle East is the 2003 Iraq war. And that war carried on for many years and in some cases even today although there are not troops on the ground it's still a peace mission of ours to get Iraq as peaceful as possible. Now the 2003 Iraq war was generally not considered a great success because even still today there is a power struggle in Iraq. So the Iraq war did remove did remove dictatorship in Iraq did give people more power who live in Iraq. However, it has not completely stabilized Iraq today. And ISIS, Islamic terrorists, extremist group, are still alive today. So they still operate today. They still carry out attacks. So they are kind of the impacts of the Iraq war. And actually, 
kind of to show that it was successful in some ways, but it was also not successful in others. So again, with this case study, how would you use it? Essentially, you would be asked a question such as, explain the UK's role in a conflict around the world or globally. So you would use this conflict and you would explain what it did, why it was involved. Now, your next topic, and this is towards the end of year 10, was coastal and river landscapes. So your coastal landscape case study is Walton on the Nays, and your river landscape study is the River Tees. So let's start with coasts. And remember with coasts and rivers that we are looking here at mainly management, okay? How it is managed as a coastal or river area. So what on the Nays is on the east coast near Clacton, okay? And the problem is it suffers from high levels of coastal erosion. It is on a um, coastline that has London clay and red crag rock, and they are very easily eroded, okay? Clay is very easily eroded. So the cliffs erode very easily. Slumping takes place on those cliffs. So that's where the weight of the material on the cliffs and the rainfall and erosion make the land essentially slump downward fall downward okay and longshore drift also takes place and that is where the sediment is moving down the beach further and further all the time it's extending the size of the beach now for this we've got three main things to think about in terms of management there was management in 1977 1998 and 1999 okay so the first management was this there was a major council project on the southern part of the coast. So that installed some water drainage to try and reduce flooding issues. The cliff profile was changed. So they tried to change the actual steepness of the cliff itself, try to reduce it from slumping. There were large groins installed. So groins are what you actually see in this image here. Okay, The wooden things that go out to sea there. They reduce longshore drift. They try and stop the beach extending further and further. And the seawall, which is behind it, as you can see here, was enhanced. OK, it was built up a bit more and it was shaped so that the water, if it did come in, reflects back out and goes back out to sea. In 1998, there was more management. £167,000 was spent for 300 tonnes of granite near the tower. Now, granite is a hard rock. OK, and what granite does is it sits in front of the tower and the cliffs. And what that does is it slows down the waves as they come in and that reduces the erosion that can take place on the cliffs itself. And finally, in 1999, there was beach replenishment that took place. Now, beach replenishment, remember, is when sand is added to the beach that's already there. It's built up to try and reduce the problems of erosion and it also reduces wave speed. So they are the management things that's taken place in Walton on the Nays in Essex. So that is your coastal management strategies. Now your River Tees management strategies. So the River Tees is in the northeast of England. Um, so it starts in what a place called Cross Fell which is in the Pennines, Pennine region. And the mouth where it goes out to sea is the North Sea at Middlesbrough. Okay, so on the northeast coast. The river is 128 kilometers long. And it has high force waterfall with a gorge, a massive open area in the upper course, meanders in the middle course, levees in the middle and lower courses to reduce flooding, and flood plains, where flooding can take place, in the middle and lower courses as well. So that's the general characteristics of this river. Now, there's one major example within this case study of management, and that is Yarm's Flood Defence Scheme. So Yarm is a historic market town. It's prone to flooding, and the last most serious flooding was in 1995. And since then, there's been £2.1 million spent on building better flood defences. So those flood defences included improved flood warning systems to warn people if a flood might take place, better communication between the Met Office, 
that analyzes weather, the police and the emergency services to try and coordinate the response, to try and get people out if needed. And new development is not encouraged on floodplains, okay? So on floodplains where the land should be allowed to be free to flood, to stop other places flooding, uh, new housing buildings, etc., are not encouraged to be built there due to the fact that it can flood. And that is called land use zonation. Land use zonation is where you basically split up the zones, areas of land, and say you cannot build here, but you can build here. So that is a major example in Yarm of how the River Tees has been managed. Now, how would you use these in an exam question? Well, look out in the exam question in your distinctive landscapes section for the word either coastal or river. OK, so it will be coastal or river landscape in the eight mark question. Once you know what that is, you know which case study to use and you are likely to be asked about the management of a coastal or river landscape. So your next topic is changing climate. Now, for changing climate, you have two case studies. One of them is the UK and the other is Tuvalu. And the case study for the UK is just about the impacts of climate change on the UK. But your case study for Tuvalu is the impact of sea level rise as a result of climate change in Tuvalu. So let's start with the UK. All right. So the climate of the UK is likely to see a two degree rise in temperature by 2050. It's likely to get warmer and wetter winters. And it's also likely to get warmer and drier summers. And we're already seeing this in the last 10 years specifically where we do have warmer and drier summers. So that's the first impact of the climate. OK, the second ones are about flooding. So coastal areas are low lying. They are likely to see more and more flooding. They already do. So these low lying areas are going to have more flooding. Erosion rates are going to go up. There is going to be more erosion over time and there will be more elderly people suffering because we see that the population of coastal areas is more elderly. So more elderly people may suffer as a result of these erosion rates rising and flooding taking place. So they are flooding impact. Extreme rainfall. We are going to be getting more extreme rainfall. More flash flooding, more floods in winter. Currently, that costs £1.3 billion a year, but that is continuing to rise. Heat problems. So because of the rise in heat, particularly in summertime in the UK, there is going to be a rise in deaths and illnesses due to heat problems and water shortages in the south. Remember, elderly people and very young people are vulnerable to temperature changes, OK? Their bodies do not cope with regulating their own temperature as well as someone who is fit and healthy in their 20s or 40s or 50s or 60s, OK? So the rise in heat will affect their bodies and could, if they have an illness or weakness, result in more deaths. We already know that in the south and southeast of the UK, there are extreme water shortages that is set to get worse as well. So that's another impact. However, all of the impacts I've mentioned so far are negative impacts. OK, so the climate, coastal flooding, extreme rainfall and heat problems are all negative impacts. But you also need some positive impacts. So there are a few. The UK can now grow, for example, grapes like in France. Those grapes can be used to make wine. That wine can be exported across the world and sold. English sparkling wine. That has an economic benefit and an economic impact. OK, so there's new incomes created as a result. Another positive impact that's not mentioned here for you is higher temperatures and drier summers mean also we get an extended summer, which means higher tourism rates. That's another positive thing for the economy that creates money. So that is your UK case study of the impacts of climate change. You do need negative and positive impacts there. And remember to try and use social, environmental, economic and political impacts. Now, your second case study for 
climate change and rising sea level in this case is Tuvalu. So Tuvalu are nine small islands in the South Pacific near New Zealand and Australia. They are low lying. There is no part of Tuvalu that is above five meters above sea level. OK, so it's a very low lying area. The population is 11,000 people and it is an economy based on fishing. OK, so its main economic gain is fishing. Now here you need the impacts and the management of those impacts for sea level rise. So what are the impacts of sea level rising in Tuvalu? We get increased salinization. Now, salinization is salt water from the sea getting into the soil. All right. So that is water pollution. And that's going to affect the soil and farming. Water wells. So the wells that obviously collect and hold water in them will be polluted by seawater and other pollutants. Droughts may become more common as a result of climate change. But also remember tides because of sea level rise may flood homes and roads and actually in Tuvalu, this already does happen. OK, it already does flood homes when the tides do rise significantly. The water bubbles up from under the ground here. And another impact is that the main airport runway is under threat. And remember, an airport is really important for exports and imports. All right. People traveling to and from the islands. So that's a really important economic factor in Tuvalu. So there are all the problems and impacts that sea level rise and climate change are creating. Now, the management of those impacts, how are they or have they been managed? So uh, the government have a campaign for community action. So the government wants the community to get together to help each other to have action on this. People are migrating to nearby New Zealand. These are climate refugees. They are migrating because they have no choice due to climate change and sea level rise. And Japan is also finally supporting a coral reef restoration program for the area. And that is to keep its habitats and its natural ecosystem as healthy as possible. So Japan is supporting Tuvalu with that. Finally, you've got two images on the screen for these two case studies. As you can see on the left there, this is 2019. OK, and this is the maximum temperatures and the anomalous or the anomaly value above 1981 to 2010 rates. So what it shows you is that obviously the whole of the UK here is getting warmer. All right. And on the right here, we have some diagrams that show 2006 and 2014 and the rates at which the coastline is disappearing. Now, your next case study, and this is the second to last, is dynamic development, and that is Zambia. So in dynamic development at the start of year 11, you study for eight lessons, Zambia, and we look at development in Zambia, how Zambia is developing. Remember, Zambia is in Africa. OK, and let's start with its history. So it's a landlocked country. It's not connected to any seas all right, or oceans. It's surrounded by other countries. It has lots of copper. All right. It has its main resource is copper. It was a British colony. So it was actually part of the British um, Empire. And its population is 14 million people. Now, Zambia was part of what are called the MDGs, the Millennium Development Goals. And this ran between 2000 and 2015. OK. So it had mixed achievements with these. It did see HIV rates drop. It did see child mortality drop, but it's still high. There was 90 percent attendance at primary schools now compared to beforehand, which was lower, which is good. And 10 percent of people still suffer from AIDS or HIV. OK, so HIV is still a problem. Attendance at primary schools has got better, but not full yet. There is not full attendance. But child mortality, as we said, was still high. Now, in terms of copper itself, in terms of the resource that it's rich in, it relies on copper. 70 percent of all of its exports is copper. That is a very large amount of exports solely reliant on copper. Between 1970 and 2000, copper prices fell quite a lot, which means that Zambia did not make enough money from copper and it fell into debt. 
Today, however, in 2020, the economy has what's called diversified. So actually now it doesn't rely as much on copper because it now relies also on tourism. And finance and trade has also increased with other resources. So its economy has diversified and it's gone away from just trading copper, which is a good thing because it means it is a more solid foundation to grow. Now, take a look at transnational companies in Zambia. Um, transnational companies in Zambia, which are multinational, so they work around different countries in the world, provide jobs and income. Um, they pay tax, so that supports the government, and it means the government can spend more money on development in Zambia. However, one major problem with transnational companies being in Zambia it, as it, is it means that essentially small companies find it hard to compete as they pollute the environment as well. OK, so smaller companies kind of lose out to the bigger multinational companies. OK, so think about you at home. You probably have branded clothing. All right. So Nike, Adidas, etc. Those are multinational companies, whereas the smaller retail companies can't promote themselves as well and remember tncs pollute the environment they pollute rivers they uh, use fossil fuels etc so that's also not good for the zambian economy or the environment now water aid on the second part over here water aid is an international organization it's an international charity that helps or has helped zambia so it provides fifty-four thousand people with safe water and 42,000 people improved sanitation. Okay, so improved toilet facilities. That's all very good. And then finally, you had to, at the very end of the Zambia case study, look at a top down and bottom up project. So, top down is where the government or an international organization has designed it. Okay, so it's designed this project. Whereas, bottom up is the local community. Okay, so the top down one was the Kariba Dam. And the Kariba Dam was built, obviously, to um, protect against flooding, but also to create hydroelectric power. So it is a hydroelectric dam. OK. And the energy from this is vital to the power to power the copper industry. So it's actually used to create the power to, to um, extract the copper, etc. It's also used for fishing. And it's also used for tourism. Uh, 57,000 local people, however, were evicted from the land surrounding the river to be able to build this dam. And that was because of flooding concerns. All right. So 57,000 people were moved on from the area they lived, their homes, to build this dam. So that's a kind of a negative impact of building this dam. And it's a negative impact of this top down project. And finally, your bottom up project for Zambia was Room to Read. Now, this was a project aimed at helping girls to learn how to read more effectively. So it targeted girls particularly and girls education. So it increases the educational awareness among girls to be able to start reading and writing. It was small scale. It was community scale. So the biggest problem with it was so even though that it did help girls to read and it did increase the awareness of girls reading, it is local. So therefore, its national impact is minimal. OK. Now, all of that was the Zambia case study. As you can see, and as it's taken quite a while to get through, the Zambia case study is a very large case study. And you can be asked about very, very diverse in um, things with this case study in your exam. OK. So you could be asked things such as evaluate the top down and bottom up project of a developing country you've studied. In other words, how good was the top down project or bad and how good was the bottom up project or bad? You have to evaluate it, say what's good, say what's bad, make a decision on whether it worked overall or not. You could also be asked about the impacts of TNCs in a, an LIDC or an EDC. OK, so you could be asked about what's good about TNCs. What do they do that's really good for a country? And also then what's bad about a TNC, what they don't do. OK, so there's just some examples of the questions you could be asked where you would have to use development in Zambia.
And finally, your final topic today is resource reliance. So this is your last GCSE topic. And for this topic, you looked at two different countries for food security. So how secure and reliable food sources are. And that was the UK and Tanzania. So let's start with the UK on the left here. OK, so remember, the UK is a population of around 65 million people and it has what's called a high level of food security. And that means that we have a good reliability on food. We can grow enough and we import enough to be able to feed the population. So calorie intake in the UK has actually decreased since the 1980s. We actually do eat less calories than we used to. The levels of obesity, however, have increased because we have more inactive lifestyles. We don't exercise as much as we did. We sit at office desks, for example, OK, all day. We don't get out and exercise enough. And the UK has exported 19 billion pounds worth of food and drink in 2013. So the UK is a good, large exporter of food and drink. OK, so we consume Quite a lot of food, but not as much as we did in terms of calories in the 1980s. We have become more obese because of the types of foods we are eating, but also because we are more inactive than we used to be. And we export a very hefty amount of food as well. Good for the economy. In terms of our food security, 23 countries supply the UK with food. OK, so we rely on 23 countries to supply us with food, apart from the food we grow ourselves. The UK meets half of its own needs. So half of all of the UK's food is actually grown and reared in the UK. We have close ties with the EU for food trade. So we do rely on the EU heavily for food trade as well. So we are pretty secure in that we can get our food from us and elsewhere around the world. However, individual people might not be food secure. OK, you have to think about poverty, for example. So we have in the UK have had different attempts to become more food secure. And they are, for example, food banks, which are depended upon by one million people in the UK currently. And we have over 400 actual food banks in the UK. So this is mainly for people who have found themselves in poverty or hard times and they will go to a local food bank and they will request food to feed their families. Many people don't earn enough nowadays to have full stocks of food. So therefore, that's where these food banks come in and they help top up people and keep them food secure. Other attempts at food security have been things like allotments. OK, so allotments are used in urban areas like Luton, for example, nearby that has many allotments to grow for people to grow their own vegetables. So for families to grow their own vegetables. These are council controls. So the local council controls these. And there are currently around 300,000 allotments in the UK. And there is work ongoing to try and increase this amount, to try and increase families' individual food security so they can rely on themselves for growing vegetables. Now, that is all an example of a country, an AC like the UK, that has food security, has high levels of food security. OK, and a question on this might be using an AC you have studied, assess its attempts at food security or assess its food security. But you also may be asked to contrast an AC with an LIDC or an EDC in terms of food security. So your contrasting case study is Tanzania. And in Tanzania, we also have, like we mentioned a few minutes ago, top down and bottom up approaches as well. And these are important because you could be asked to individually evaluate the success of the top down or the bottom up strategies. OK, now Tanzania, if you look at the map on the bottom right, has a SAGCOT area. And that is the Southern Agricultural Corridor of Tanzania. It is the darker green area in Tanzania, as you can see here. And this was identified as an area that is good for growth economically and therefore environmentally and for food particularly in future.
And that's because it has main routes through it, it has main towns through it, and it has lots of land that can be used to grow food on. So Sagkot is an example of how Tanzania has tried to increase its food security. Now, background on Tanzania. It is one of the poorest countries in the world. Okay, it is an LIDC. 51 million people live there, so the population is slightly lower than the UK's. And it has a low level of food security, okay? So it does not have very good food security. Its food supply is not great. Everyone does not have good access to food. Now, in terms of its trends, it has what's called serious hunger on the Global Hunger Index, the GHI. Okay, so it's classed as being seriously hungry. 32% of people live in food security. All right. So that means that only 32% of the population are food secure. And that also means, therefore, that 68% are not food secure, live in food poverty. Incomes are very low in this country, and that is one of the reasons. Now, your top-down approach to food security. So this is an international approach. This is international organizations and other governments helping Tanzania to become more food secure. And that was the wheat program, which was provided by Canada, 95 million US dollars in, or yeah, US dollars in aid was provided. And this project covered 24,000 hectares of land, okay? Now, those hectares of land, if you think about 24,000 hectares, that is hundreds of, th hundreds of thousands of football pitches, okay? It's a large amount of football pitches, so it's a large amount of land. Tanzania almost became sufficient in growing its own wheat and not needing imported goods. So this project provided by Canada and the 95 million pound in aid, 95 million US dollars in aid, should I say, actually helped Tanzania nearly rely solely on itself to create its own wheat. That's all good. That's a really good outcome of that top down project or approach. Now, your bottom up strategy. OK, so this is a local community strategy to try and create food security. And that is in the Babati district in the south. And the Babati district is a rural area. It's 90 percent rural. And this bottom up strategy was provided by Goat Aid and Goat Aid helped the local community launch this program in 1999 and it lasted until 2006. £200,000 was invested in this project in the local area. And essentially what this did was it goat aid gave communities goats, gave them their own goats. What do goats do? Goats provide milk and meat for families. OK, so what it did was it allowed families to start rearing goats, to have cattle on land, to start breeding them. And so they had milk and meat. All right. Really nutritious foods. It also educated farmers and children on how to look after the goats and how to use the goats for their own benefit. OK, so how to make food security using the goats. So that's all good. It was a really, really positive project in that sense, because it gave families and local communities more food security through meat and milk. However, very much like the uh, Room to Read project, OK, in Zambia, this project was only small scale. It did not benefit people nationally. So it had a small impact on Tanzania's overall food security. Now, that is all eight topics. And all of the case studies. That you have in those eight topics, that is your main case studies for the entirety of your GCSE. Hence why this session has been quite long. However, I hope you find this really useful as a way to revise those case studies and remembering how to use them in eight mark exam questions in lessons. So I hope you found that useful. And make sure you keep using this as a reminder to yourself of how you use your case studies.